Um, I'm from the Kentbury Earthquake Temporary Accommodation Service. Uh, we are, um, have a group of people, and there's three arms to the service. One is the financial side, whereby once your temporary accommodation runs out from your insurance company, there is a financial package available to you. That depends on how many are in the household, etc. Um, the other side of the service is our matching accommodation team, whereby they, um, if you need temporary accommodation to live in, they, um, they've linked in with rental properties, landlords, and of course our temporary accommodation villages. We also have earthquake support coordination service, whereby you have um, someone there to help you go through the process, go to meetings, and maybe link you into suitable you know, services for you. But they'll be there with you the whole process as long as you want them. Thanks, Nairi. Um, my name is Mark Rectigal from Bank of New Zealand. I lead a team at BNZ called Future Hub. So BNZ has been managing EQC and insurance settlements for its customers for the last four and a half years. About two years ago, we realised that uh, customers were really getting frustrated about getting accurate advice regarding financial options and property, um, given the ever-changing ever environment that was happening at the time. So we set up a team of specialists, um, which we call Future Hub, and that was to assist the people of Christchurch and not just BNZ customers move forward. So working with insurance, EQC, uh, residential advisory service, CTAS, and others, we've assisted over 5,000 customers during that two years, and um, uh, over 670 of those have been non-BNZ customers. So uh, Renee and Sarah do, do such a good job explaining the bank's part uh, and involvement in all this. Um, really, all I can do is just reiterate uh, a, a few key points. So if you have a mortgage or you may want one to fund any additional improvements, make sure you talk to your bank before um, making any cash settlement commitment. The best outcomes come from making fully informed decisions. And if a mortgage is in place, the cash settlement goes to the bank as an interested party uh, directly. So the bank wants to understand the damage that's um, occurred on the property and then your intention to repair or in reinstate its security. The bank will be able to then discuss the options that are available and the obligations that, um, that you have at that time. Each bank has a different approach to settlements and each decision will be based on the customer's uh, particular financial circumstances. Usually the bank will want to maintain a balance between the debt and the long-term value of its security. The preference for the bank may be that the property damage is uh, repaired and reinstated and uh, part of you know, the key focus of the bank at the moment is really uh, to make sure that the insurance is still in place and still going to be covered. If it's not, it will have um, uh, an impact on the value of that security. The bank will want to work with you to make sure that um, you make a good decision. So don't shy away from talking to your bank. It's an important part of for this. All right, so thank you very much. I'm going to just hand the microphone over to Brian. And um, Brian is going to, to start to take your questions. So he'll just start at the back rows and move forward. So if you do have a question, just signal to him and he will hand you the microphone. Um, I've got a question um, that might involve both Renee and the RAS advisor. Um, whether you're cash settled or whether you go into a managed repair either with EQC or with your insurer, you have safeguards in place with regards to um, faulty materials, workmanship, under the Consumer Guarantees Act and no doubt under other facilities as well. But what happens in either of those situations or both of those situations if the contractor or builder goes into liquidation or goes out of business, what safeguards have we as consumers got in situations such as that?
So under an insured um, managed program, then the way that we manage payments to builders is we pay at milestones. So we never pay for work that hasn't been done. So if a builder went out of business and they've only done the foundation, we would have only paid for the foundation. So therefore what we would do is find you another builder and we'd continue on with that repair or rebuild and no one would be out of pocket. The only thing is there is a bit of a delay because you generally have to close up the site while you work out what's happened to the builder that's gone out of business and there can be a bit of a delay. Um, I don't think we've had it in any of our managed um, program to date but we have thought about if it did happen what would we do. I would recommend the same type of payment plan if you're managing your own. So builders are quite used to it that you make payments at milestones throughout the process and I think the what the difference is between our managed process and your own cash settlement process is the bank manages those payments. Um, that's, you know, that's the key thing in terms of uh, protecting yourself while you're going through that process is make sure you pay after the work has been done and you're confirmed it's been done. Yeah, so, uh, and legally it's completely different in, in either scenario. So if you're in a managed program, so you're in Fletcher's program or you're in a managed insurer program, then they're responsible even if the builder goes into liquidation. Um, but if you've been cash settled, then that risk is on you. Um, so what you need to do is really check that the build is viable before you go with the builder. And again, you check with the milestone payment. So you don't pay until they've completed certain aspects of the build. Um, so you want to check and find out about the build company. Um, and they do have a lot more disclosure requirements now with the changes of the Building Act. Um, so you want to really find out as much about the builder as you can. Yep, I understand and, and thank you for your responses. Um, but the responses have mainly been with regard to a builder or, be, you know, like up until the point where the job is completed. There is also the scenario that if there's a problem after the uh, job is completed, that uh, there is no comeback, I guess, if a builder goes into liquidation or a contractor goes into liquidation. You know, what are our rights or what are our expectations when that happens because from where I'm looking at now we've potentially got no comeback against anybody. Yeah so I would probably if you're really worried about that get someone to check the work straight after it's finished so whether you get an engineer to come and have a look at it so check that the work's all completed and fine and they've met all the requirements that they need to for the code of compliance um, but you're always going to have that risk um, that 10 years down the track that builder might not be around but you've got other people that might be responsible so if it was going through a full consent you've got the council if they haven't done the proper checks um, and yeah you've you've just got to get that check straight after the build if you're really worried about it I think also if you use a master builder they have their own guarantee is that right so that they guarantee their work so that using this, uh, an association like that would be advantageous. Um, unfortunately, there is always an element of risk whether you go through an insurer-managed program or go direct. So in the case of IAG, for example, the contract is still between you as the homeowner and the builder. We're not a party to the contract. So in that instance, all we can do is try and help you to get the builder back on site. But no matter what... Um, solution you go with, there is an element of risk for the homeowner. The homeowner is high and dry if after the repair, say three, four, five years down the track, there's a problem found and the builder's no longer around, it's tough luck. I, I'd say it all depends. It's case specific about what's happened, who signed off on the work, who was there, um, when was it discovered, um, have they actually completely liquidated? Um, are they? It, it's all very case specific about what's happened. Hi, uh, John Byer. Uh, there are a couple of questions I've got about uh, the insurance angle. Um, in the first case, we have, say, a house which has been declared a total write-off, therefore one option is rebuild. But the other option may be 
a uh, payout. Now, how is that payout determined, you know, the, the value of the payout? So it's based on replacing what you had at the time of loss. So hopefully your insurer did an assessment before the house was demolished. And in some cases we haven't been able to because how homes were so badly damaged. But if there's assessment done, then it's based on the cost to replace what was there at the time of the loss. Okay. Uh, that's one option. And now the other option is the as-is option. In other words, the insurer pays the owner an amount of money, and uh, one part of the equation is the value of the house as is. And uh, so how do you determine what the insurer pays in that case? So we would still pay what it would cost to rebuild what, there were, what was there at the time of loss. So then if you decide to sell it, the as-is equation is for you to work out with a real estate agent or whatever someone will pay, but your insurer will still settle you um, what it would cost to rebuild. The only thing would be if, you, if your intention was to sell it as-is and there were some things that were additional things that would only be needed if you rebuilt, then they might be deducted. So if I can give an example of that, um, if there were retaining walls and actually you were going to fix those retaining walls, they wouldn't be included. But we'd still have to assess what it would cost to rebuild the home. Right. So what you're saying is the insurer pays off, pays out that yep. total amount to rebuild. Yep. Okay. And then the owner can either Do. choose to rebuild or... Sell as is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, the other aspect about this is um, on the uh, amount to be paid out, um, does that include things like, you know, bookcases, expensive bookcases which have been installed after the building was initially constructed, uh, shelving that have been put in afterwards, etc. So as long as it's part of the structure, and there would be a discussion around whether it's part of the structure or part of the contents, but either way it should be covered if it was damaged. It would just depend on if it's part of the contents claim or part of the structure claim. Well, you know, in the case of a rebuild, for example, yep. um, you might say, well, this house costs like $400,000, but on, on top of that, of course, is like an expensive bookcase or expensive shelving, stuff like that. Is that included over and above? Yeah. So okay. what you would generally have on a scope is what we call additional value items, and that would be included in the additional value items. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No Sorry, um, I've got a little bit to add to that. It also depends on what insurance company you're with. Um, they've all got different policies. Sometimes they're different from IAG, so they might not pay you out on the rebuild cost if you don't actually have an intention to do it. So I'd probably recommend you'd come into the residential advisory service or to your lawyer to go through, go through what your policy's got and what information you've got, and then we can work with you to explain how it all works and what options are available to you. Hi, um, I'm on actually on a cross lease, and we've been going through the process with the insurance company, because we're over cap. Um, we have now, well, we've come to, well, I got an email from my insurance company basically telling me now that um, they're going to force a cash settlement on me, which is this something they can do, being that I'm in a cross lease. Um, it depends. So if they have already started now in the managed path, so they'd already assigned a builder, you'd already signed up for it, then arguably no, they can't do that now. Um, but what they might say is it's frustrated if you have another um, cross-lease owner who is not wanting to reinstate or were, wasn't insured. Um, but if they were down the path of actually managing it, then no, they can't just cash settle you. Um, out of the blue. But it all depends on your insurance policy whether they can manage it or cash settle and what election they've made. But generally insurance policies allow the insurer to cash settle instead of managing. Uh, 
I just had a question in relation to the one just before in terms of contents. Um, if you're cash-settling and you're still going through a process that you don't know what's going to happen, but you're cash-settling, and, and as you said, Renee, you best to probably talk to everyone and figure out what's on a whole number of factors, okay? So in terms of um, content stuff, um, I mean, you know, I logically claim for all the things I considered contents at EQC, and then they closed off the period of the claims. And then I heard along the um, way that carpet's considered as contents, and it seems to be a, a sort of swing back from the days where carpet was probably a lot more expensive and people would roll up and take it with, with them. I had the kind of sense that anything that you'd sell a house for and then you'd walk out with was your contents and what remained would be belongs to the house. So that's a bit of, I guess, a bit of a misnomer in a carpet. But just in, in talking to the builders yesterday as we continue through the scope, damage to a dishwasher, um, and they mentioned, well, that's contents. And I go, well... I wouldn't imagine that anyone would leave a house and take a dishwasher with them because it's all plumbed in and they're different sizes. But then what the question was just saying before, if it comes under contents and then it comes under house, and, and I mean the comment by the builder, oh, it doesn't really matter, we'll just put it down and the insurance company will set it up. But if you haven't exceeded your 20, I think it was a 20,000 under EQC quota, and then all of a sudden you're going back for whatever's deemed to be contents, and they go, no, sorry, we closed your claim when you did it years ago. But, I mean, this stuff was all to do with the house, and so where does that sit, and will they even, even do those kind of things? So EQC don't treat any claims as full and final. So if it's contents, then you can go back to them. Okay. Um, so if you can clarify it with your insurer because each policy will describe what is contents differently. So, so you look under the definition of home yeah. and you look what they what do they include in that definition. Um, but if the insurer is saying it's part of your contents claim, then you can go back to EQC. Well, this, this is just a builder's opinion. I guess the builder doesn't know even what policy I've got. They well, know, you can just know. ring EQC and ask them, okay. is, is the dishwasher part of this contents or should I okay. go back to my insurer? So, I mean, I've got the top IAG one at the time and it's in plain English, but really um, there's a lot that you can read between the lines in the plain English, um, so it's all very confusing. You know, I don't know whether dishwashers are... Well, either way, one of them's going to have to pay, so mm. just figure out who's going to pay No, it. that was just yeah. the worry, is how you actually go back to EQC after all those years of saying now it's determined, there's that, so, okay. So in something like that, I mean, coming back to EQC, you can do that here at the Hub, where we have the community contact team, and you can book an appointment with them and speak face-to-face -face with EQC about that. And at the same time, you could also come in and talk to the Residential Advisory <coughs> Service and perhaps maybe bring your policy document with you, and they can look at options at helping you interpret your policy. So maybe coming into the Hub during our operation time on Monday to Thursday and speaking to EQC and RAS um, could help you through that process as well. Um, in the case of a dwelling, which is a multi-unit building, so, you know, two dwellings joined together, and they're both fee simple. Now, um, let's assume that they're both badly damaged. So the options are, you know, rebuild or pay out as is. What's the situation in terms of the parties having to agree to a specific direction? Or, you know, one party says, oh, I want to do this. The other one says, I want to do that. So that's quite an unusual situation. Are you shared on one foundation slab? Is that how no, you're connected? No, no, no there's a, a, a big party wall between the two. Yeah, so you probably have an obligation to keep the party wall there. So if one um, one property owner wants to keep that house, you probably have an obligation to support them in some way. Um, so you probably might want to talk to an engineer to see if they can actually be severed safely um, and if 
that one property wants to stay there, whether that can happen. If it can't, then you're, pro you're going to have to get into negotiations with your neighbour about what happens. You've also got an easement, I imagine, um, for that party wall. So you want to go to Land Information New Zealand or your property lawyer and find where that easement is and see what obligations you have to each other. Um, but I'd say an engineer would be your first step. Um, and also keeping the lines of communication with your neighbour open. So both of you are brainstorming together about what's going to be best for both of you. Um, in the case where relations break down between neighbours as well, the only thing that we can really um, suggest if it gets to a point where you can't negotiate is some kind of mediation because for us as insurers, we can't force either party to accept a settlement. So we have in cases, we did think that we would probably reinstate more shared property um, than cash settle, but there's some situations where you have five owners and one is not insured and one doesn't want to move ahead now. And so we are seeing a lot more cash settlements of shared property, but our preferred option is that all neighbours can agree and all parties can agree before um, we have to get into any kind of um, legal or formal process. Okay, thanks. All right, so thank you very much for your questions. And it obviously does highlight uh, that there are a lot of considerations to take. And I think something to take out of this seminar tonight is definitely to seek advice and to find ways to um, help through this process. So as, I, as we've all mentioned, there are services that are here that can help you and certainly the legal advice of your own lawyer as well.